Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on. In childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to episode 30. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and today we're going to take a deeper look at the term giftedness. It's more than just intelligence, and it's not just about being talented at something. And being gifted doesn't mean that someone necessarily has it all figured out or needs less attention. Dr. Jim Delisle is our guest today, and he's someone who can help us through the discussion and provide some advice that you can start using right away. A reminder that it is a huge help when you give us a thumbs up when you listen to our podcast. Wherever it is that you listen, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Google, go ahead and give us a rating and write a review. It really does help. Also, don't forget to hook up with us on Twitter, at MindMattersPod, and on Instagram and Facebook, we're Mind Matters Podcast. Test one, two, three, four. In just a minute. Uh, hi, my name is Jim Delisle, and I've been working with and for gifted kids for more than 40 years. Most of my work is in the area of social and emotional development of these kids. And I know them as a dad, I know them as a teacher, I know them as a counselor, and kids from as young as second grade all the way up through graduate school. So it's been quite a ride. A deeper look at the meaning of giftedness, what it is and what it isn't, next. If what you hear on Mind Matters makes a difference to you and your family, consider becoming a supporter. Through Patreon.com, you can chip in to help defray the cost of producing this podcast. Just decide how much you'd like to contribute, and that amount will be placed on your credit card every month. Even a couple of bucks would help cover the cost of producing the podcast and help us promote it to new listeners who could also use our help. Go to Patreon.com slash Mind Matters and become a patron. And thanks for making a difference. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. We're with Dr. Jim Delisle, whose latest book is called Understanding Your Gifted Child from the Inside Out. Jim, during your introduction, you mentioned having perspectives of giftedness both as a teacher and as a father. And the one thing that you do really well in this book is weave together a picture of giftedness using both of those personal perspectives. Why don't you take a minute and describe giftedness from your perspective to people who might not really understand it? Sure. Uh, I have lots of stories, and I can spout all kinds of research about you know test scores and IQ numbers and all that. But what brings people to, I think, read my book and what m- brings people into the field of gifted is something is different about their child, and they're not quite sure what it is. They're they're reading at an early age, or they're perceiving things even as uh, infants or above that they they seem to be uh, much more aware of what's going on around them. And when parents especially talk to neighbors about it, it sounds like they're bragging. And all it's like, no, this is my kid. You know, I'm not pushing him. She's pulling me. And I think that's basically what giftedness is, is in comparison to other kids your own age or other people your own age, you have some uh, abilities, you have some insights, you have some awarenesses that are pretty pronounced in a positive way. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. I like your description of I'm not pushing the child, but they're pulling me. I think that's a really good example of what that, especially in young kids, what that giftedness looks like. There was a quote in your book that I pulled that really kind of stood out. Giftedness should not, indeed must not, be linked to achievement in order to be a legitimate entity. Talk to me a little bit about what that means. When the field originally started, it was called the, the field of gifted and talented education or gifted and talented children. And I, a lot of people use those as synonyms, gifted and talented, and I don't. They're related, but they're not necessarily synonyms. And I say that because if you're a talented person, you, you have a talent in a specific domain. It might be mathematics, it might be reading, it might be science, it might be sports, it might be art, whatever. But giftedness to me is much more of an internal way of thinking that's not necessarily tied to a specific talent talent area. In terms of understanding uh, your place in the world, if you will, as well as just the world in general, it's at a much more advanced stage. And not all kids then express that in a talent mode. And what I'm finding is too many times 
for example, for kids in gifted programs, if they don't keep up their grades, they're eliminated from the gifted classes, which to me does no good and makes no sense. The kids are still very smart. And if something's not clicking and they're not doing the work at the level that people think they can, that's an issue, but it should not disqualify someone and say, well, you're not gifted anymore because you're not getting straight A's. That just to me is silly. I think in education in general, there are teachers who don't always, you know, they're in the classroom and it's like, I get it. Classroom teachers, they have a lot on their plates and they don't get a lot of training in, in what giftedness is. And I know that especially when you have like pull out programs where those kids are being pulled from their classrooms and are missing instruction. And then they're also struggling academically, whether it's an executive functioning issue or they really are struggling with that content you know, they don't want them to be pulled out of the class. It's like, well, that's separate, though, and they still need those services. I found that because one of the roles I played uh, was as a pull-out program teacher. And usually, I always used to say, you know, your kid is gifted on Wednesdays or something like that because they'd come to to school that day. But if – and this happens time and time again, and every time I raise it with a group of teachers of gifted kids, they nod their heads in agreement that – A kid could be sick all week, but if they're gifted classes on Wednesdays, they will come to school that day because they're finally around other kids their age who understand stuff at the same advanced levels that they do. And that's just a really comfortable place to be. In my background, I was actually a professor for 25 years, but I found that a little bit boring. So I started teaching middle school one day a week for 17 years. And middle school is never boring. No. (laughs) But uh, the school I work at now, it's just a part-time basis in South Carolina. It's a high school for gifted kids. These kids are used to being the top kid in their school. And then they come to a school where everyone was the top kid in their school. So it's a whole different dynamic that the kids are dealing with. And I try to bring that out. I want them to talk about it and talk about the anxiety of not being good enough, whatever. Well, I asked the kids, this was maybe the second month of school, I asked them if they felt any differently coming into our school than they did last year when they were attending a regular middle school. And one of the young ladies said when she came into our school now, or when she comes in now, she says, I can exhale. Mm -hmm. And I love that expression. When you exhale, you just feel comfortable. You just feel like you're in a good place. And... If I could make my classroom a place where gifted kids can exhale, I think that's a good thing. And I want all kids to have that, whatever their needs are. But I think gifted kids are sometimes given the short shrift because they're so smart. People think they'll succeed no matter what, without a lot of help. And uh, this young lady's expression of, I can finally be who I am, I think speaks volumes to the need to have these kids get together with other kids. If your talent is in sports and you step onto the baseball field, you know, with your team, that feeling of being able to exhale or if you're in marching band and you're a really talented musician and you get into the band room and you're getting ready to practice, that's that place for you. And imagine the frustration if you were a really good baseball player and the only other kids you could compete with were just starting out. You know, you could beat them like crazy. You can probably get home runs every time you go to bat. But is it really challenging? Is it really uh, something that makes you feel like I want to keep going back? You really want to be with people who are similar to you in terms of both interests and abilities, at least for part of the time. Mm -hmm. But just think of that kid who's the best baseball player in town and can only play with kids who are just starting out. Eventually, there's going to be a frustration there that is pretty palpable. One of the things that you talk about in your book is something that I hear a lot from parents. They want to involve their child in gifted programs and activities, but their child didn't qualify for the gifted program. Tell me a little bit about how parents recognize those traits of giftedness in their kids from a young age, even if they haven't been identified. People pin so much on the label itself of gifted. Uh, I always say we we don't identify gifted kids for the most part. We just validate them. It's very uncommon to identify a gifted kid who nobody suspected was gifted. <laughs> it's usually the kids who are like, oh, yeah, this looks like a gifted kid. We know that stuff. And so uh, identification to me means you're trying to find something that you didn't know was there. We're validating is kind of rubber stamping the kid's abilities that we knew all along that he or she had. So I try to let the parent know that whether the kid was given the label of gifted or not, The same kid that you had before that label is the same kid after the label or the lack of label. And they pin so much oftentimes on the the label itself and sometimes the services that it provides. But overall, I just want them to remember that whatever insights they saw in their kid is the same insights that they have now. Uh, But the other thing we do not too well in schools is kind of what you alluded to, that you're either in gifted or you're not. 
what I have found, I'm going to use another sports analogy. Most schools are very respectful of kids with different athletic abilities. They have intramural sports, maybe club sports, uh, JV and varsity. We need to have intramural JV and varsity gifted programs as well, because there are some kids who are so extreme in their abilities that they need to be with other kids perhaps older than themselves. Uh, Again, the kids I have now uh, who I'm teaching, they're ninth graders, but they're attending college. Those kids need something more than the kid who, you know, needs a little enrichment in the class because they, they know the material, but it's not so basic that they can't advance a little bit. And I think we qualify kids as gifted or not rather than doing it on a continuum. And I think we need to do that instead. Have you seen any place that you really see that model working really well? I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, but unfortunately, I see it going in the opposite direction, Mm. that the whole movement that started about uh, 10, maybe 20 years ago, actually, on differentiation where kids of all abilities are placed almost indiscriminately in classes, and then teachers, oftentimes with very little training, are expected to serve kids with all abilities. So you have the kids who struggle to learn, maybe English language learners, gifted kids, and everything in the middle, and one teacher is supposed to differentiate for all of them. A lot of what's gone on in gifted over the past, again, 10, 15 years especially, has been taking away those pull-out programs or the specialized programs for gifted kids and instead placing them in regular classes where teachers are supposed to acknowledge the kids' abilities and somehow change the curriculum to manage that. I've been a teacher long enough to know how difficult that is. Mm -hmm. We don't expect it at any other level except in elementary. When you get to high school, you have advanced placement classes, you have honors classes and all that. But why should we expect a third grade teacher to be able to handle every kind of learning ability and need with honestly very little support in many cases? I don't know. I'm just kind of making the comparison of honors and AP courses at the high school level. And what could that look like at an elementary level? Some schools do do it right with cluster grouping, which means that you'll find four or five kids identified as gifted and you place those in a classroom with a teacher who has had training and gifted. Mm -hmm. And so those kids have at least, you know, some some buddies, if you will, intellectual buddies that they can hang with. And that that's one possibility that is is workable. Mm-hmm. And actually in the uh, Paradise Valley Schools, which is a very diverse community, has gifted services that span the globe. I mean, everything from self-contained classes and great skipping for kids who need it to cluster grouping at the elementary level and everything in between. Uh, they really take a universal look at the different ways we can serve kids. Because a lot of times if we do cluster grouping or schools do that, then that's all they'll do instead of having that plus a pullout program. Right. And that's where I think we, we need to look at uh, addition rather than subtraction. And in gifted over the past 20 years, that's really not happened. You know, my 10-year-old son, who is gifted, he has said to me on more than one occasion that everyone's gifted. And I, I think what I realized is that what he's trying to say is that everyone's good at something. And it reminded me that a lot of kids don't really even understand what the term gifted means. Sometimes parents downplay their kids' giftedness or even keep it from them altogether. And it makes me just really wonder how much deeper that misunderstanding goes. That's also a mindset that a lot of uh, educators have. That Well, everyone's gifted in some way. And I'm like, no, they're not. Because, uh, I mean, I used to teach kids with disabilities. Not everyone has a disability. Not everyone is an athlete. Not everyone is a musician. And so anytime we say everyone is fill in the blank, I think we're dismissing the needs of those and the abilities of those who have specific strengths. This is not an elitist comment at all. Um, I don't perceive it to be. But in our country, we are very proud of our uh, star athletes and and star performers in the arts and things like that. And we don't mind saying how strong they are in relation to their peers in those areas. But when it comes to intellectual abilities, I think it's our egalitarian nature of our country is basically say, no, 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 you can't say that because that sounds like your kid is better than mine. And I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is they have specific needs. And to denigrate those needs by saying everyone has them, I think, is just a disservice to give to kids and the parents. And it's sometimes hard for parents to know how to talk to others about their kids without the awkwardness of seeming elitist. Parents of gifted kids are oftentimes very lonely when it comes to being able to share 
what their kids can do with other parents. Just because when they do bring up what their child can do at a certain age, people look at them like they smell funny. Like, what are you saying that for? You know, your kids are better than mine. And that's not what the parents mean 99% of the time, but it's how it's interpreted. So they're afraid to use the word gifted because they don't want their kids to be subject to that same kind of negative feedback, if you will. I was just in, in Pennsylvania last week working with about 50 uh, gifted high school students. They didn't know who I was from anyone. And yet they'd all been identified as gifted in these very rural school districts. And so I just started the conversation by putting up something that I call the eight great gripes of gifted kids, which is nobody tells us what giftedness is. School is too easy. People expect us to be perfect. So instead of focusing just on the word gifted, I would focus on some of the things that happen when you're identified as gifted. Mm. For example, everyone expects you to get straight A's. Well, if you never got them before, why should a label assume that you're going to get start getting them now. So I don't think we have to address the issue initially. The word gifted is loaded. A lot of folks don't like it. But if we go by talking about what some of the characteristics of gifted are, some of the things that you experience when you know things that other kids don't yet know, then we can kind of use the word gifted from the back door rather than the front door. And then add another layer to it. Many of the parents and grandparents of these kids were also gifted, but had no services to take advantage of. Maybe they weren't identified at all, or based on what we know now today, maybe misdiagnosed. And, you know, to this day, I think those people are really afraid of even accepting that label for themselves. Well, it's funny when I talk to parent groups, which I do quite a bit, I'll ask them, I'll say, has any, you know, if you have an identified gifted kid, have any of your kids asked you if you were gifted? And a few hands go up. I say they never ask if you are. They only ask if you were Mm -hmm. (laughs) because they think giftedness is just something you get as a label in school. And the way I perceive gifted, no, you have it as a lifelong attribute, if you will, a series of attributes. But yeah, because parents are like, you know, I might have been gifted then, but I'm not now. Uh, Yes, you are. You know, it all depends on your definition of gifted and conceptions of it. But when you deny something about yourself that you want your child to be proud of, that sends a mixed message. Yeah. And that's why I want parents to be as open as possible with the kids uh, who get identified. And I, it happens quite often as I'm giving a talk for parents of gifted kids. People will come up at the end and they'll say, you know, I came here to learn about my kid and I'm learning about myself or my spouse or significant other. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't go away. The same qualities and characteristics that you had when you were a little guy, you're still going to have when you're a full-grown man. And if your kids see you constantly denying it, then their insecurities tend to start piling up too. Right. And you put yourself, and I see this time and time again with identified gifted kids, when they get together with other gifted kids, which I think is a great thing to do, if we don't talk about these issues, they begin to think that I'm the bottom of the top. I'm the dumbest kid in the smart kids class. And we need to really address those issues because when I do it with my own ninth graders, about 70% of them, when I say, close your eyes, I'm going to ask you some questions. When I say, I'm I'm probably going to be the dumbest kid in the smart kid school, about 70% of the hands go up. (laughs) And, you know, when I say, say, open your eyes, I say, you know, 70% of you cannot be the dumbest kid. (laughs) It's just statistically impossible. One of you is the dumbest kid, but 70% of you cannot be. (laughs) they, They laugh. And that's what I want them to do. I want them to acknowledge that when you're in a, a new situation where your abilities in the sense of being tested by others who you see as having even higher abilities, we need to discuss that. We need to, we need to get it out in the open instead of making believe it's not there when we all know that it is. There's this phenomenon with parents. They don't want to be that parent. They don't want to be the squeaky wheel. They're afraid of that pushback or retaliation against their child. So they just don't even want to rock the boat. You know, the sad statement about that is if you had a child with a disability, you would not be afraid to go into a school and say, this is what my child needs that she's not getting. And you'd be protected by federal and state law because those kids who identified as having disabilities are required to have services in schools. In gifted, that's almost non-existent. There are very few states that require the level of services for gifted kids, the kids with disabilities would get. And so, yeah, that's one of the, but to me, that's a sad statement that you can't even talk about the needs your child has without being perceived as being ungrateful or intimidating or something. Mm -hmm. The best thing I found that parents can do 
because uh, there's there are very few teachers who you know wake up every morning and say, "I wonder how I can bore my smartest kids." <laughs> that just doesn't happen. But sometimes it doesn't fit. And the more specific a parent can be, you know, if you go in and say, "My child isn't challenged," trust me, as a teacher, I can't do a thing with that because it's too vague. But if you can bring in evidence of, you know, a, a young girl who's doing higher level mathematics when you're requiring her to do times tables or something. If you can bring in evidence of this is something my child can do and how can we make it work that she's allowed to do this or encouraged even to do it during school. Mm -hmm. If they're reading books when they enter kindergarten, as some gifted kids do, and the kids have to learn their letters, it's like that's going to be pretty dull after a while. So just the more specific a parent can be about the needs rather than say, my child is bored or not challenged, that doesn't go anywhere with me as a teacher. Right. But the more specific you can be, I might not like to hear it, but at least I can do something about it if I choose to. Or if possible, and this is sometimes hard, because parents aren't educators, but to offer a possible solution. Exactly. I have parents who come in and ask me if I can recommend some books for them to recommend to the teachers. You know, what are some resources? Yeah. Because, you know, teachers get overwhelmed too. I totally understand that. I've I've been there. I've been, you know, the gifted teacher in a building and trying to help those teachers. Yeah. But at the same time, as my mother would say, askers are getters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you <laughs> right. have to you have to be the one who who steps up. And also I feel like that models for your kids self advocacy, mm-hmm. you know, and that's an important skill too. It is, yeah. One of the things I found is, and this was true with our own son's education in elementary school, that principals do not like parents coming in saying, I want my kid to have you know, XYZ teacher. Mm. That doesn't go over well. But what we did, and it worked every year, my wife and I are both educators, and it worked every year except one, was we went in to the principal and we said, this is how our son Matt learns. He's very creative. He's quite independent. These are the ways that he learns best. He, he, you can give him direction and he'll run with it. Which teacher in second grade works well with kids like that? Right. What you're saying is I want the best match between my son's uh, learning styles and abilities and a teacher who can handle that. And I found that, again, except for one year, which was the year from hell. Yeah. So so the year from hell, is that the year with your son's math teacher that you wrote about in the book? That was only a class from hell. Oh. No, the year from <laughs> <laughs> That was a, um, again, our son was a strong math student and he was in the advanced math class in seventh grade. And he'd come home, and he was a pretty conscientious kid about homework and stuff. And so we'd go in his room, and he'd be recopying his mathematics notes in a different format. And I'm like, okay, Matt doesn't really need these notes. He's, he's a straight-A student already. What we're going to say, Matt, why are you copying your notes again? Uh, and he says, my teacher requires it to do notes her way. And I said, oh, I'm sure you're mistaken, Matt. Oh, no, no, we have to do them this way. It's worth 20% of my grade. So uh, we went in, basically, and thought, of course, the teacher's going to be reasonable, and said, you know, we, our son's a straight-A student, uh, all of his work is turned in on time, but this note-taking, you know, he doesn't really need it because, and she would not relent. Wow. She just was like, every kid does this, and it's always best to start with the teacher. And we did that, and then we went to the principal with the teacher, and he backed her up and said, if she wants it that way, that's how it's going to be. So we gave our son permission to not do that part of his homework, which was taking an inordinate amount of time. He could have been spent outside playing or doing something more important and basically said, the grade is not important to us now. What's important to us is that you do things that that matter to you. And I hate putting teachers down and I'm, I, I don't, but this was just an unreasonable request. Mm-hmm. You know, it was worth 20% of his grade. I think he copied the notes like half the time or something when he had extra time to do it. But I just wanted him to know that to follow a rule even if it's given by an adult when it doesn't have any justification that I can give to him. There's no validity to it. It just didn't seem right. Mm -hmm. So it was us advocating for him. And as you said, that's what I want kids to do is to do it themselves as they get a little older. It's not just about getting the A. Yeah. The grade is not the end goal. My wife and I combined had probably 50 years teaching experience behind us. And to be written off as just pushy parents. I mean, if, if we couldn't even, I don't want to say get our way, but if we couldn't get our point across in a way that changes were made, I feel bad for the parent who doesn't feel that they have the educational authority to go in and ask. But if you know you're a kid and you do better than anyone, if you're a parent, then you know when things fit and when they don't. So one of the chapters in your book is titled, Write Your Dreams in Pencil. Mm-hmm. And I really love that. Tell us a little bit about what that whole concept is about. I find... Uh, so often that from a young age, I'd say young teenage age anyway, gifted kids tend to state 
goals that they have for themselves. I'm going to go to Harvard. I'm going to be a surgeon. Whatever it is, and they're kind of hardwired to go in that direction, and not think of other possibilities. And so, if it doesn't work out for one reason or another, they're left shallow. It's like, well, I tried for this and it didn't work. What do I do now? Uh, when you know that eighty、uh, percent of kids who enter college change their major, usually four or five times.、Mm -hmm. So to tell a sixteen-year-old, seventeen-year-old, you have to pick what you want to be at forty, and then they stick with that, and then they realize for whatever reason, maybe it's a good fit, but a lot of times it's it's not the fit that you thought it was going to be. Right.、Uh, and we found that in the book. I write about our, our son's experience. As a freshman in college, and he, from the time he was twelve, wanted to go to this particular university, and applied only to that university. Actually, no, that's a lie. He applied to two universities because we said you can't just apply to one. Well, the second one he applied to was an all-girls university, so <laughs> <laughs> so technically he followed our rules. But wouldn't you know, he got in. So he got into the school he'd been wanting to go to since he was twelve years old. He got there, and within a month realized it was the wrong place for him.、Mm. And as I elaborate in the book through letters that he and he wrote to us, and we wrote back to him, it was a very challenging year. He was 1,200 miles from home. It was before email, so this was just by letter and telephone and all. And we saw a kid's dreams just dissolving, and it was painful. It was the most painful year of our lives as parents.、Yeah. Uh, Matt ended up leaving that school and going to another school that was much better fit. But the write your dreams in pencil is when you put them down in pen, like I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to love this college, and it doesn't work out. You can't erase that ink、right. without seeing what your dream used to be. I was just having a conversation with a parent yesterday. She was talking to her husband. Her daughter's in, in elementary school, late elementary school, and, and was saying, "What do you think our child's going to do as an adult?" And the dad just goes, "Wild card." <laughs> I don't know because of that multi potentiality. Like there's so many possible options. Yeah. But it's good because I think they, as parents, are willing to keep that door open. It doesn't matter. She'll figure it out. I, I wish that was true with more parents, because when you have, like, for example, I keep going back to our son, but his major was creative writing. And virtually every adult, including his、uh, high school counselors, kind of looked at him funny and was like, "How are you gonna ever make money doing that?"、Mm. And the majority of adults just thought he was wasting his abilities because he was a smart kid. He is a smart kid,、mm -hmm. but to take somebody's dream and tear it apart because it's not gifted enough—oh, come on! You know, it's their life to live, not ours. I got the same when I said I wanted to be a teacher. And I was told I was too smart to be a teacher. There's no money in it, and boys aren't teachers. No one, well, very few adults ever said or asked why. What is it about teaching that really attracts you? And I think that's the question we parents need to do: is when their kid comes up and says, "I want to be a tattoo artist," or "I want to be a whatever it is," and it sounds like okay, fine, then you basically back off a little and you ask questions about what is it about that field that attracts you. When you're fourteen, fifteen, seventeen years old, you're not looking at how much money you're going to make. You're going to say, "What feeds my soul,"、mm -hmm. and run with it. It'll probably change.、Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, then maybe they were meant to be that tattoo artist. So, Jim, I know that you're kind of retired now, but you work an awful lot for someone who's retired. <laughs> What's next on the horizon for you? Is there anything in the works? I still teach gifted high school kids one day a month. And I always like to say the the best way to teach ninth graders is one day a month, <laughs> and so I, I do that, and that just that feeds my soul.、Uh, my wife and I just had a new book come out called、um, "Creating Strong Kids Through Writing," and we are both adamant that you can get kids socially and emotionally much more aware than they are through writing activities that aren't the dull five paragraph essays that. Kids are sometimes required to write. So even though I'm retired,、uh, I'm not really. You know, I'm still working with kids, writing books,、uh, traveling to Kuala Lumpur to speak, and all that kind of stuff. But it's the kids that keep me going. If I go back、uh, every month and just have that one day with those ninth graders, it just it's, it stirs my soul. It's a good thing. Dr. Jim Delisle, it's always a pleasure having you. Thanks. Thank you so much. More to come. If what you hear on Mind Matters makes a difference to you and your family, consider becoming a supporter. Through Patreon.com, you can chip in to help defray the cost of producing this podcast. Just decide how much you'd like to contribute, and that amount will be placed on your credit card every month. Even a couple of bucks would help cover the cost of producing the podcast and help us promote it to new listeners who could also use our help. 
Go to patreon.com slash mindmatters and become a patron. And thanks for making a difference. Why do you think gifted kids love their gifted classes so much? If you took a moment and asked them, they may not even really know. Or they'll say it's where they get to do the fun stuff like robotics and technology. But there's definitely more to it than just fun. When gifted kids are in a classroom and they're not challenged at their level, they become bored. A gifted program that's a good fit allows those students to enter a state of flow. Flow is the intersection of challenge and ability that leads to growth. Too much challenge leads to anxiety. Too little challenge leads to boredom. But the Goldilocks zone, where a learner is challenged and they're making progress, leads to a state of flow that is empowering and exciting. This leads to motivation and a love of learning. And those are vital components of the emotional needs of gifted kids. But another huge part of meeting the social and emotional needs of high-ability kids comes from the opportunity for them to be with like-minded peers. So a few years after college, I ran into someone who I'd gone to school with from elementary all the way up through high school. And we were talking, and I just remember he said, Oh yeah, you and... Name change to protect the innocent. I never knew what in the world you were talking about. I knew what he meant. The asynchrony of being gifted made it really hard to connect with most of the kids in my grade. So let's make sure that we're giving kids the chance to be challenged and grow with other students who think and learn like they do. What we'll be doing is giving them the foundation to build healthy social and emotional skills that they'll use throughout their lives. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. See you next time on Mind Matters. I'm walking down the street on clouds instead of the concrete. I'm dancing through. Everything's about to come my way. Nothing can ruin my day. No matter what anyone does or say, I smile at fools. No, I don't care because I am on my way up and I won't stop. I won't slow down. Steady on my feet, I'm going to rise up. No, I won't stop. It is my time. I know what it's like to be broke I know what it's like when nothing goes your way So I'm gonna let myself enjoy The fruit from this lucky day Yeah, I am on my way up I won't slow down The Mind Matters Podcast is on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod, on Facebook and Instagram at Mind Matters Podcast. Consider giving us a thumbs up and review, and we'd appreciate your help spreading the word to your friends. If you can, become a financial supporter at patreon.com slash mind matters. Mind Matters executive producer is Dave Morris, and our music is by Epidemic Sound. Our web home is mindmatterspodcast.com. Thanks for listening. I am on my way. I won't slow down. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services. 